There we go. Uh, uh, welcome to the uh, Lit Crawl Sensitive Skin number 11 release party. Uh, yay! I've got, copies, I've got copies here for sale. I'll have some of our older issues. These usually go for $25 tonight. Only special price of $20 or maybe even less if you do. Talk to me nicely. Uh, is there anybody here in tech? Does anybody here work in tech? Because, you know, the mission, what would the mission be without tech workers? Uh, for tech workers, I have a special, it's $50. Yeah! yeah. Oh. Awesome. Uh, let's see. Uh, so they told me, this thank you fellow barber for having us here. They told me a long time ago that if I uh, hung around the barber shop long enough, I'd get a haircut. And it happened tonight. Finally. Um, nice. And uh, what else did I want to say? Uh, uh, yes, yeah, so on my way here, I was behind a car, and it had a license plate uh, that said WWJNI, and I've been trying to figure out what that means. So uh, here to help us is is Jesus. <laughs> uh, <laughs> fiction, existential meditation on mortality, and I don't think people are taking me seriously, so um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change that. Oh, anyway, we're going to start off with an epigraph from uh, T.S. Eliot. Time present and time past are both perhaps present in time future, and time future contained in time past. If all time is eternally present, all time is unredeemable. What might have been is an abstraction remaining a perpetual possibility only in a world of speculation. What might have been and what has been point to one end, which is always present. The scholar stares into a hole, its four walls flush with geometric precision, too dark to distinguish the floor. He leaps anyway. When his boots hit the ground, he's almost surprised. Like Alice chasing her phantom hair, he feels smaller now. On tiptoe, the scholar presses up against one wall, stretches his arms full length, long fingers grasping, nails scarcely crossing the edge. Even if he had the strength, he can't pull himself out. With each grab of the dark, he slips onto his back, head jerked to the side, thud against a wet wall. No thoughts but to fly, to be elsewhere. He elbows a corner, it doesn't give. He gnaws at his lip, and the blood comes fast. Filthy and tired and foolish and everything hurts. He kicks his school bag, heavy with pillage. He kicks again, and the words on his tablet shrink from the page. With each follow-on blow, a release. Human sound, unattached to words. He will not cry. Another, and his tablet cracks on the inside. He doesn't know how. Once more and the scholar folds. The hole is now a resting place, the bag of rough stone for his head. The scholar curls snail-like, arms strapped across knees to still the shaking, mute lips sucked into a stained mouth. He thinks how he might be dead, wants to believe he's dreaming. If he were alive, these tears would burn. If he were living, they'd burn and he would know. Anthropomorphology, the study of how and why a culture ascribes non-human dead things with living human attributes. Angels, they say, are often unable to tell whether they move among living or dead. That's a real quick from the first elegy. The scholar as exquisite corpse. Picture this, quilt of winter gray cloaking the late afternoon sun. The scholar on his classic 76 Vespa, tricked out with racing stripes and gilt edge mud flap, hums over the broken pavement toward the Eastland family lot. He's three weeks into research for his postgraduate thesis, the anthropomorphic construct of graveside statuary, case study, Mountain View Cemetery, Oakland, California. He's working straight from sunup until a half hour before midnight. 
At which point, he raises a glass, a single double shot of mid-shelf whiskey, to toast the monologues of TV talk show hosts and pretend he's part of popular culture. He doesn't eat or sleep much anymore. Every morning, morning he showers and shaves. The scholar knows the value of appearances. We appreciate the gesture. Sadly, we're the few who do. He almost only leaves his room to lie about the dead. We wish he'd face up. Our stories are his story. We're his looking glass. And while he doesn't yet realize this, he may soon enough, with a nudge, a kick in the pants, drop kick to the diaphragm, whatever it takes. For the scholar, there is no escape. He's gone fishing, and it's not what he expected. We're the fisher and the bait. He's the one that's hooked. Whether he thrashes about or plays dead, he is an expert corpse. We're reeling him in gently into that good open place where the light never dies. See for yourself, he's here now. The scholar meets the Eastland angel. The scholar's all wrapped up in his thoughts on what it means to be human and what it means to be a corpse, a skeleton, an old suit and dust. He breaks for the plot nine elite, Requois, Chabot, Latham, Ryer, Eastland. Our colleagues from way back when we would breathe the golden air of Upper California. He surveys the treetops and statues of the graveyard's skyline, then slips between the sphinxes at old James Latham's portal. Pat on the kerchief's sorry. Pat on the kerchief skull of a granite guard cat. Now he's stumbling up the broken stairs, imagining the dust sparkly with soul, or if set free at the moment of death. Said soul flying off into the ether, into a newborn, into nothing. Faithful acolyte before puberty, the scholar's been prone to existential fits ever since he first took a double blade to his chin. While his current anxieties have little to do with the blood spots on his throat, we're pleased to see that straight razors have gone out of fashion. The scholar suffers from an older, deeper wound incurred half a lifetime ago and a fundamental misunderstanding of what it means to be dead. Beardless kid fails to consider that maybe we hang on until the after party at least. Don't want to check out before the cake is served. Call it vicarious indulgence if you must. From there we live in cameos and dreams and the waking hours of those who sacrifice to keep our memories alive. More real than mementos, far from an ethereal blackout. Poor boy fails to acknowledge the obvious, thinks he lives all on his own. No one escapes blood or breath or the heart. Soul has nothing to do with it. At the threshold of the Eastland lot, the scholar genuflects before a child-sized angel. He's mumbling about the magnitude of his field work, the impossible analysis of 220 acres of stone memorials. He peers over his shoulder at the Amazon on the adjacent Ryer lot. There he goes again with a brow, sweats, shortness of breath, heart rising in his throat, a pulsing lump of failure. The cheeping trees mock him, the sky bears down. He steps lightly on the lawn, determined to follow the day's plan. He bows again before the statue, telling himself he always succeeds always. An unsteady calm washes over him. Something about the Eastland angel beguiles the scholar. Perhaps its diminutive stature suggests a more manageable effort, or its desecrated form arouses long-buried empathy. Whatever the draw, this century-old hand carving offers a trace of consolation. Speak to me, he whispers, now face to face with his winged dearest. As if moving in for a kiss, he notes the following. Washed out eyes and cracked nose, dirty little nose and mouth, parted lips in prayer. Mottled face like freckles, colors strange with the light. Brown to matted cobweb, gray, gray, greenish lichen, fuzz the cheeks, faint blood red dribbled down the chin and neck, rust stained, gritty teeth and eyes, lidless, faded, white, they haunt in dreams and waking hours. Can't look through me, cannot see, but I feel, I don't know what, don't know what it is to, but I, I, I do feel somehow summoned by the vacant stare. What happened to you? Well, thanks. Thank you. All right, thanks everybody for coming around the time. Nobody, nobody, we can stay
LAPD's news, Angel Garcia. He was in sensitive skin number nine. Right. Three times that. Look who else is in here. John Larry Art, Samuel Delaney, Vladimir Mayakovsky. Good Lord, Frank Frith is in here. This is crazy. You got to get one of these. Uh, and our, next, our next leader was also in this, and he's also, um, of his many claims to fame, he is uh, uh, Jesse Helms' least favorite writer. You can look this up on YouTube. I'm not kidding. Doug Rice. I wanted to read from this book, uh, Dream, Memoirs of a, uh, Dream Memoirs of a Cloudless, but you can't read from it. You have to, you have to buy it. Um, <laughs> you do. I don't, because I wrote it. Um, and the reason you have to buy it is like the meaning of the book is in how you touch it. You know, so you can't, I can't actually read from it. So the, the book opens up and becomes naked. And we had a bunch of people emailing us about the book coming apart, but the book is designed to come apart. <clears throat> so when it falls apart, then I'm exposed. And then throughout the book, there are a series of photographs and a philosophy of photography and, and text, and a memoir about me, about my years when I was a girl. Uh, they were back in the old days. So, <clears throat> but I, it, it really is literally impossible to read this book aloud. You have to re really feel it and touch it and have it in your hand. So if you want to touch it <laughs> later, <laughs> you can do that. So I can read from this book. This is my new novel, Here Lies Memory, which is coming out in Germany before it comes out here, I guess. But anyway, uh, and this is a story about gentrification and what's going on in my hometown in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, back home. And what has been going on after the Vietnam War and so on, and how gentrification actually affects not just memory and the trauma of memory and of, of who you are and your identity, but also relationships. So this is a, a short scene from, from a, a relationship in the book. Love, love like that kind that I felt, I is the name of the character, A-I, not I, not, not me. Love like, I, like the kind I felt when parents touched her was fragile like an egg. So he knew to touch her slow and patient, the way rain touches skin, the way frost melts from blades of grass. He touched her in this way with his roughened fingertips worn to the bone from years of living in a city of dust and heat. Why are you leaving, man? I'm going to look this way, <laughs> that way I won't get hurt, you know, my feelings will not get, you got no ego, man. That's great. That's great. Yes. That's great. Yes. That's great. Yes. 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 Are you ready? <laughs> this guy's going to get heartbroken. Man. All the blood and all the sorrows of all those yesterdays washed away when she looked into his old eyes, and she told him that, she told him straight what he did to her. How he woke up what needed to be awake in her, all of it. And she told him how she never wanted to go back to sleep again, not ever. That she was done with sleeping. She told him that she felt her name was safe inside her, his mouth. The way you say it, I said. The way you release my name into the world, you keep my name warm. It's a, they said home inside your mouth. Then she asked him to say it, to say her name. The first night they spent together, she taught Clarence more about touch than a lifetime of women and of working in the mills had ever come close to teaching him. She turned him inside out and made it seem to Clarence like he had never touched any other woman before. She taught him that you have to dismantle a heart to truly see what a heart can know. It's like opening your eyes in the morning and wondering where the night went, she said. And Clarence touched her as if he were a boy without a way of knowing what touch could do. Her lips quivered and her moans at night would have broken the darkness inside any man. I taught him to use his hands, the tips of his fingers, to flirt with the impossible. She did this to him. And as they slowed down, as their breathing became quiet and the rain fell against the window of her bedroom, she said, listen. And when she wasn't busy saying she wanted him, she was, she, she was busy telling him all that she desired when she closed her eyes and stayed awake more awake than she had ever been before in all her life. That kind of being awake that made the rust on her soul disappear. Do that thing to my bones there. 
that bone. Do that thing that you do with your mouth, your hand, your teeth, to that bone. And like he was finding a way to pray, he did. And she would say yes, her mouth wild with laughter, her throat soul deep with the songs of ancient rivers. And then she would stop breathing for a while, not long enough to die, only long enough to come close to dying. Only long enough to come close to dying. Long enough to see into some other life that no woman had ever given herself the right to see into before. A life that no man had ever given himself such a right to see into either. She told parents to do this, to do that, and he did. And her breath would get stuck in her throat and stay there until she remembered how to breathe. A quiet longing that took her into the memory of the time before she had bone into flesh, a time when she was pure of words. And then I would say, again, she would say, again and again and again, your teeth, just that, your teeth. And her skin would wait because her desire was so deep, and his touch would wait because waiting was as much like touching as touching was. And I began speaking in the original language, the one that had been left behind after the Tower of Babel had fallen. Her voice, her body, her mouth discovered that language, those first words, and she opened herself to them. And she screamed those words out near Clarence's body. She bit so hard into his collarbone, she drew blood. I scratched into his back, dug her fingernails into his flesh, left scars, ruined him for any other woman. She infected, infected Clarence with her past, with all that she had done, and with all that had been done to her. She gave him this fever of all she had ever known, all that had crossed her path and had ripped open her skin. She pressed her mouth against his ear and mumbled words that were like a breeze across a desert, lifting sand but making no sound, leaving behind no trace. Words that destroyed everything Clarence thought he knew about himself and changed him down to the very root of his knowing. When he felt the girl weight of her body on his old body, the pain of every heartbreak he had ever experienced in his life, the pain of every bro bone that had ever been broken in his life, the pain of losing his parents, of nearly dying from starvation, lifted and disappeared into thin air, as if none of it, as if nothing bad had ever happened to him. I gave this to Clarence. With her, the memory of every other woman that he had ever known faded. Then she left. Clarence stood on the corner of Pride and Colwell Street, <coughs> listening to her voice, looking into her dark eyes. He, held, he felt his hands wanting to do something, his feet longing to walk, to make a getaway. He felt something happening to his lungs, a scar formed in his eyes, and a voice urged him to clear his throat of his desire for I and find other stories, other women, other bodies. But her beauty paralyzed Clarence. The dark skin of her elbows and the even darker skin of her knees, the insane beauty of her thin feet, of her hands. He could not imagine ever seeing beauty comparable to the beauty resting in the palms of her hands. If he could have imagined such beauty existed somewhere else in the world, perhaps then he could have walked down Colwell Street to where there was beauty close to the eyes beauty, maybe down Dinwiddie Street to Fifth Avenue to Red's Bar and Grill. But those delicate, strong lines in the skin of her palms, lines that cut deep into her memory, kept him standing there. He would never again see beauty near eyes. So he stood before her and he waited, unsure of what he was waiting for, of what there was left in the world for a man like him to see. And Clarence became cold, colder than that February winter that had fallen on him. He stood at the edge of the Monongahela River and cursed his heart, his foolishness, his grandmother, his ancestors. For more than a year he wandered the streets of Pittsburgh, unwilling to talk to anyone. He had given up on what words could do, on words carrying any meaning with them. Words for Clarence only erased what was there and true. And every time rain fell, he still heard an I voice saying, listen, thank you. Thanks, Doug Rice. Doug Rice, the real deal. Doug Rice came all the way here from Sacramento. He said that he came because he wanted to meet me. And then I realized, I reminded him that we actually met at a meeting in New York City about 20 years ago. I said, what the fuck did I come down here? <laughs> uh, so yeah, since some skin started in New York City, Lower East Side, way back when, early 90s, and then we revived it about five years ago. We're here to celebrate our new issue. 
You can find Doug's piece, his, his piece, lots of all this. All this stuff is on the website, www.sensitiveskinmagazine.com. Uh, I used to own the actual Earl Sensitive Skin, but that's a long story. Anyway, um, our next reader is in the new issue, and uh, I'd like to present uh, Mark Olmstead. Who wants snacks? Anybody want snacks? I actually came from a Tibetan Buddhist ceremony. This is this is female Buddha Day, so. This is like the Eucharist, and I'm going to pass it around. You don't even have to believe, but you may have some interesting dreams. Uh, anyway, <laughs> consider it. Uh, I have to say, this is, I, I've actually paid money for, for copies of this, and now I'm in it, so I'm very excited. And it's a particularly beautiful issue. I was really impressed with, you know, I opened it up and I went, wow, what an incredible layout. So. It's, it's a really happy uh, event to be in this magazine, which I already thought was super cool. And uh, so this is an excerpt from a novel that will probably get published after I'm dead. Uh, <laughs> if you're young, you may have a chance to uh, enjoy it. But uh, <laughs> at any rate, this is, this is the place this, this is 1986 LA. This is a, a fictional, uh, story, <laughs> and uh, uh, I was trying to break in, oh, I've already fucked it up, yeah. I, <laughs> I blew my anonymity, um, the character was trying to break into screenwriting, and as you can imagine, that did not go well, uh, so anyway, the, sto the section is called Atomic Submarine, we kissed while Atomic Submarine blazed in the TV midnight, an old childhood spooky thriller that was still rather disturbing. A submarine rams this flying saucer and weird sexual goo comes out in stark black and white, and a gooey, one-eyed, tentacle alien like a devil god lures the crew members away. One gets cooked by electricity, blinking in negative, while another has a space hatch close on him like a scythe. Saw that on LA's chiller TV as a disturbed eight-year-old and it was still rather creepy in that 50s sleazy way, rattling the subconscious with perverse images, Eisenhower's id. But Nikki, Catgirl, Nymphet, ex teen junkie, now just 21, baby-faced baby doll, conversant in all my literary heroes, little cigarette smoker, hair jet black thatch with a splotch of purple, two braids hanging down. I had wanted to kiss those braids at first sight. Little kitten, a sort of teen Susie Sue, marvelous white tight little body. I think my butt's too big. Ah, insane these women and their butts. When Nikki had the cutest heart-shaped butt of all time, I have this thing for writers. Oh, honey. Nikki, scary, impossible to hold. Anything could happen, like Texas Dynamite. I kissed her thigh in my mind, her ankle dainty on the sheet, her little toes. I thought of her earnest fascination with the world. She had come from a pit full of horrors even I hadn't seen. Slamming dope on Skid Row, poor little eyes fogged with dope. Oh, heartbreak, oh, bleat, oh, lamb. Too much, too heavy, stop the jukebox. Finish the horror movie, no black valentines. Surrender to the impossible world of doom and honey. After digging my thumbs into my neck, I drove to an AA meeting, weeping in the car, <laughs> afraid, but the fear had found its sorrow of teary release, and my neck softened as I wept behind sunglasses in the LA sunblast of a 1987 rush hour. Then a call on the answering machine from Nikki when I got in, stepping from the foggy streets of Venice Beach where the yellow moon folded in its yellowy mouth in a blear. So I called her and she said, I wish I could see you now. And I glanced at the clock. I'd be asleep by now, ordinarily, the workhorse, but I said, why don't you come over? And she raced in the moonlight, and we pounded the sheets. Oh, nipple biter, a muscular talk, cunt, and tiny bud clit. Sex, 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 such a hot little fuck as she whispered appreciations up at me after my ego had taken such a beating from this town of hell. So I stumbled into work, neck loose, goon grin, planning to see her again next night, suck her lips, a face and ass, hold her little breasts in the beat up world. Then I had a Nikki headache because I was afraid of Nikki. She might be a vampire. She might be a pony that would run away. 
a young Mustang filly that would run and her hooves would sound in my aching head. She might be Bathsheba going to my bed as she did with arms and bracelets clanging as we fucked. She might be poison. She might be a bottle with an X with three X's. She might be a needle contaminated with AIDS. I had a Nikki headache because she wouldn't call. Now she called and I still had a Nikki headache. She came over, started acting weird, and finally said it was all too new. She was worried. She'd never been intimate before with anyone, even coherent. She was afraid of hurting me. She was afraid. And though she undressed and was in my bed in just bra and panties, she got up, dressed, and left like Garbo. I'll call you Saturday or Sunday. The heroin girl, now appearing in your living room, now calling into your telephone, now vanishing with withdrawal symptoms. The heroin girl gives a party and you're invited. You're the guest of honor. You're the only guest, and the heroin girl whispers, she says, you're the one. <laughs> consumer of tea products in the United States, Jenny Wade. I'm the novel beer. Warslav Kvarisevich, Pered Zerlom. Я, 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 что за дикое слово? Не взял и вон тот, это я. Разве мама любила такого? Это серого, пала съедова. И все знающего, как смея, Разве мальчик по станке не летом, Танцевавший на дашних баллах? Это я, тот, кто каждым ответом, Желто-ротным, внушая поэтам Отражение слову и страх. Разве тот, кто в полночные споры Все мячи чищу в клаве бобрыт, Это я, тот же самый, который на трагические разговоры научился молчать и шутить. Впрочем, так и всегда на сродине роговой земного пути. А ничтожный причинник причиня, а гладыш заплутался в пустыне и своих средств водов не найти. Да меня не пантера прыжками на парижских чадах загнала. И горгилые нет за плечами, только есть одиначество в раме, говорящего правда стихла. This is the translation. In front of the mirror, I, 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 what a wild, elusive word. Is that man over there really me? Did mama really love someone like that with a pasty yellow face? Half gray hair and all knowing like a snake. The boy who used to dance at summer parties up in the country. Is that me? The one who now induces revulsion, malice, and fear and newly hatched poets with every remark. The one who poured all his boyish energy into late night arguments. Is that me? The very same one who has learned to keep quiet or make jokes when conversation turns to tragedy. And still, it's always, it's always like this, halfway along this world's fateful path. From one trivial cause to another, and look, you're lost in the wilderness and can't find your own tracks. Yes, it wasn't a panther that drove me with leaps to this Parisian attic. And Virgil is not at my shoulder. There is only loneliness framed in the looking glass to speak from the truth. This is a poem about a sad and lonely dog. Who's the poet? Fyodor Solubup, as I said. Oh. <laughs> 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 Ясный улыбцах так пусто, так нет бог, Не слыхать шагов, ни хруст, 
просто ничего. Землю нюкая тревога, жду я бед. Слава Пане, по дороге чей-то свет. Никого нигде не будет быстрый шаг. Жданный путник, кто же будет, друг и враг. Под холодной луной я одна. Нет, не в мочь меня, я забою у окна. Высока луна, Господня, высока. Грусто мит меня сегодня и тоска. Просыпайте, нарушайте тишину. Сестры, сестры, войте лайте на луну. God's moon is high. I am low. All day I've languished in silence. Not a single friend is barking. All around me a tedious and awful silence. The bright streets are so empty, so lifeless. Not a sound, no footsteps, not a squeak. I sniff the ground uneasily. On the street, the weak scent of someone's tracks. Nowhere, quick steps, waking no one. Waiting for someone, will he be friendly or not? Under the cold moon, I'm alone. No, I can't stand it, I'm going to howl by the window. God's moon is high, it's high. Sadness torments me today. Wake up, disrupt the silence. Sisters, sisters, bark, howl at the moon. <laughs> The Great Vladimir Mayakovsky. Я знаю силу слов, я знаю слов на бат, они не те, которые в рукоплещик Божий. От слов таких скрывается гроба, шагача дёркаю своих дубовых ножек. Бывает выброс я не на печатах, не иста, но слово мчится, подъеднув под руки, звенит века и подползает поезда. Лизать поездили, мозолистые руки. Я знаю силу слов. Глядится пустяком, опасный, где песком, под каблуками танца. Но человек душой, губами, костяком. I know the power of words. I know the alarm bell of words. Not the ones applauded from the box seats, but the ones that make coffins break loose and walk off on their four wooden legs. It happens, they'll abandon you, unprinted, unpublished, but the word races on, tightening the saddle girth. It rings for centuries, and trains will crawl up on their knees to come lick poetry's calloused hands. I know the power of words. It looks like nothing, falling like a flower petal beneath a dancer's heels but a man in his soul, his lips, his bones. <laughs> that was the great Jenny Wade. Can you can tell she used to be a rock star, but really. she was like signaling me to a floor. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and our next reader, uh, uh, you can also tell his roadie, his rock roadie instincts. Uh, just he ran over here and tightened up that mic stand. He couldn't help himself. Uh, and then he proudly announces himself as a uh, uh, ex junkie and bank robber, but he doesn't talk about being the road manager for the Dead Kennedys and Flipper. I don't know. Anyway, here he is, Patrick O'Neill. <laughs> This is sort of like a bedtime story. It's uh, broken, San Francisco 2006. It's Sunday morning and the girlfriend has spent the night. I get up while she's still asleep and walk down the hill to sneak us a couple of lattes. At the corner cafe, I say hi to a few of the regulars, and the barista takes my order. So I lean against the counter, I kind of shift the eye glance at the barista's massive cleavage because her tits are fucking huge. <laughs> you know, I know it's sleazy behavior, but I just can't help myself. And besides, it's not just degenerate abject voyeurism. I'm comparing it to my girlfriend's boobs. It's like resentful research. <laughs> One more thing on the checklist of what's lacking in my life, which is typical of my mental state lately. I've been nonstop comparing myself to everyone and everything, from my job, to my car, to my relationships, to my financial status, to my entire fucking life. 
I look over at the guy standing next to me and compare the latte he's drinking to the one I'm Because I know his is better than mine. I just know I'm fucking missing out. This comparing shit is not only mentally exhausting, but it has me reevaluating every aspect of my life. Like my relationship with my girlfriend has lately gone from a mutual love fest to a one-sided narcissist narcissistic free-for-all. Which totally sucks, but I'm scared to be single. So instead of breaking it off, I make myself miserable at comparison shopping other women's attributes and checking up further resentments. I'm still contemplating the barista's tits I turn trudge back to the house, lattes in hand. My girlfriend is still in bed. So I put down the drinks and take up my clothes and slip under the covers and wake her up. In an uncharacteristic display of affection, she pulls me into an embrace. You know, and for a second, I remember how it was when we first got together. And when she pushes me down and climbs on top, my dick gets hard. She has her ass raised with her back to me. For those of you that are a little confused by this, it's called a reverse cowgirl, and that still doesn't help with her fucking Google. <laughs> and with her hand, she guides me inside of her, and I grab her hips, and we start to fuck. Strangely, we're going out pretty hard, roughly shoving and ramming our solid together, both of us giving it more than one effort that we have in a very long time. But, you know, I should be enjoying this, but I'm... Too busy comparing it to sex other people will possibly have. <laughs> I don't notice when I slip out of her, and as she pushes down, I automatically thrust up instead of going back inside of her. My cock slams into her crotch just in her thigh, crunching against her pelvic bone with such an impact that I think I hear an audible snapping sound. I could just be imagining it, but yet what I'm not imagining is the intense shooting pain that went through my entire body. <laughs> oh my fucking god, I yell. Which she takes to be an expression of passion. <laughs> She's got her back to me, can't see, but when she grabs me, I shout out pain and slap her hand away. She goes, what the fuck it knows wrong with you, Gio? I push her off, grab my cock, and it hurts so bad I can barely breathe. When I get the nerve to actually look, I can see it's bent somewhere in anyone. It's really <laughs> like a giant pig kielbasa. <laughs> Jesus Christ, what happened, says my girlfriend, who is now crossed on the other side of the bed. Pulling the covers up like that's somehow going to protect her from my throbbing. You know, not in a good porn way, remember. <laughs> I don't know what to do. I'm thinking ice, I'm thinking soaking a warm bath, I'm thinking my dick is fucking broken, it's going to fall off. <laughs> Suddenly my girlfriend jumps up and starts getting dressed. Well, what are you doing, I ask. I gotta go, she says. Really? You're leaving? She doesn't even look at me. She grabs a purse right before slamming the door on the way out. The emergency room is packed. On the taxi ride over, I had hoped that it would be a Sunday and there wouldn't be any casualties in front of me, but I was wrong. And after 40 minutes of standing in line, I'm finally at the triage window, you know, which isn't really a window. It's actually a wall of plexiglass with an intercom. And ideally, it'd be nice to have a less public setting to discuss my injuries, but uh, <laughs> this will have to do. Reason for your visit, asked the nurse, who's young, of course, hot looking, with the hair pulled back in the ponytail. I've uh, hurt my. Uh, Yes. I whisper his intercom. Excuse me, sir, you'll have to speak up. I look around the waiting room, there's mothers with sick kids, a guy with an old wound, a woman on crutches, a drooling crazy, a couple of hookers, some homeless folks, and a few guys with bruised faces. Who fucking cares what these people think of my damage appendage? I need to see that doctor. I need to see doctor right now. I broke in my fucking dick, I screamed. <laughs> the entire way you won't fall silent. You know, then it orderly appears out of nowhere, because, you know, dicks are important. I guess, uh, the people, you know, and uh, immediately ushers me through a side door into an examination room. He gives me a hospital gown and tells me to put it on. And only the last time I looked at my dick, it wasn't that pleasant. I'm a little afraid to take off my pants. You need to get undressed, says the hot triage nurse from the front desk before she was standing in the doorway. Uh, it's pretty bad, I say. Actually, I'm sure I've seen more, she says. She flips on a pair of latex gloves. <laughs> I slowly pull down my pants and my underwear, and my dick flops out. I almost cry. It's a dark purple bruise and blood so bad. It looks like those horrifying medical anomaly photographs of genital elephantitis. <laughs> oh my god, she screams. <laughs> she stares at my, uh, my crotch, a gloved hand covering her mouth, and and then she looks out of the room, of course. This still a lot of confidence in me. Uh, I take off my shirt, I throw it down, and lay down on the examination table, and I go, you know, can my life get any fucking worse? I say that loud. And I'm bombarded with thoughts of amputation and penal reconstructive surgery and my doing my career as a porn star. <laughs> so what? You're like an S and M or something? Asks one of the doctors. I must have passed out. There's like three of them standing over me. Penal trauma, says another. Like, is that, that isn't fucking obvious. <laughs> Just sex with my girlfriend, I say. Dude, you need a new girlfriend, says the doctor.
Patrick, thank you. Next, Ron Richardson is going to read for us. He was in the last issue, number 10, covered by Charles Gatewood. Anyway, remember all this stuff, www.sensitivemagazine.com. There's Ron Richardson. This is how to read a poem. This is how to read a poem with plenty of pregnant pauses about to break water. Make them feel your labor pains. Let them know you suffer to give birth to art. Art. Blow the world apart with the golden fart. Let them know this is no ordinary speech. This is a literary event. So emphasize every word as if each word were a golden turd. Shat by Shatner doing Shakespeare in the park, in the dark, like a shark, hunting a meadow lark. <laughs> this is poesy, poet tree, from which you pluck yourself. Use literal hand motions so they will not misunderstand the thought you've got behind each labored line. Let your voice rise expectedly, expecting, <laughs> rejecting, accepting. Let your voice fall. Let it waver. Savor the flavor of being a savior of words. Look around and around and around your audience, but never ever make contact. You are looking for something deeper <laughs> than your audience. Look beyond them. Open your eyes wide, as if you are outside, your own hide in the wide, wide world. Let them see that you see sense in something as senseless as poetry, something deeper, something steeper, something beyond words. For words are only turds golden turds, so get your shit together. Speak to the ceiling. Speak over your audience's heads as if your words were too ethereal for ears, as if your words deign not to profane the insane lane of their auditory passages, as if your words would fain explain the vain attempt to reach heaven with words. Look up to fallen gods. Then shake your head and take a breath. For it is vain, 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 vain to explain the train of your thoughts. For you know that gold is heavy and cannot ascend. Poetry is pretension. There is no other way to read a poem. Thank you, Ron. All right. I just wanted to say one thing. things that uh, I'm suffering from uh, uh, post-concussion syndrome, so I can't really be uh, held accountable for what I'm going to say. And uh, the, the, the doctor said that I had received a number of blows to the head over the years and they're uh, cumulative and probably Patrick probably kicked me in the head at that dead Kennedy show in 1979 <laughs> in Providence. Anyway, uh, so I, I have to ask, I, I don't think so. I think everybody read. Did I forget anybody? That's, that's what I'm trying to say. Everybody? Yeah. All right, then is, is it okay if I read something? Yeah. Can I read something? Uh, you can read? I can read. You can read. Awesome. I can't read. 
kids know this stuff. Anyway, uh, so this is, a, anyway, I wanted to, I also wanted to say that this new issue is dedicated to the memory of uh, Maggie Esto, um, who, uh, uh, a, a great poet from New York who, who died last winter. And we were on Facebook, and she was actually, she was, she was like known as like the, 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 the great spoken word artist in the 90s, and then she started reading, writing mystery novels, and then she was living in Huston, New York, and was working as a realtor. And she started to see something on Facebook, and I said, I got a great idea for a book. It's just like a mystery novel about a realtor who like goes into a house and finds like some of these unravels. So mystery said, yes, let's write it together. And then she, and then she died. So. Uh, uh, I, I decided to write it myself, so I'm going to read just a little bit through there with me. So. <clears throat> and the name of the book is Never Been a Better Time to Die. So, uh, my friend Barney, the contractor, was rebuilding a teardown in Mill Valley for a quick flip. Wait, what? How do you rebuild a teardown? Let me explain. See, there's this great loophole. You knock the whole house down, except one lousy stick poking up from the rubble, a single two by four will do. Then, as long as you conform to the original footprint, you don't need the permits required for a complete teardown. You can get away with a lot of stuff, cut corners, save a ton of dough, get that house back on the market that much quicker. So you can do it all over again somewhere else. Anyway, I needed a favor from Barney, so I told him I'd catch him at his work site. I had a new client just a few blocks away, an estate sale, so I figured I might as well kill two birds with one stone and stop off first at the house of death. Of course, that's not what we called it when the listing came in the office. That's the name the newspapers gave it later. You've heard all about that by now. As I rolled up to the old lady's place in my X5, I thought the joint looked like a hard sell. Cracked and peeling redwood siding, sagging roof, rattling single pane windows, a lot of stairs. Another circa 1905 bungalow gone to seed. Those boxy window thingies sticking off the second story didn't help. What are they called again? Oh yeah, gables. Not seven of them like that stupid book you had to read in high school, just three. That was enough to make it a candidate to be talked about by the neighborhood kids in hushed tones come Halloween. Like a lot of old houses around here, it was cobbled together over the years, added on to and redesigned by a series of bunkhead do-it-yourselfers, each of whom knew just enough about construction to fuck shit up a little more. Worse, they all had ideas, or even worse than that, taste. Why not throw some gables onto the patchwork hovel? They will only increase its value. So the little shack got bigger and bigger, like a slow-growing cancer. As if all this wasn't bad enough, the lot was off, the mudslide waiting to happen. No sane person would build on a parcel like this. But this is California, so there were plenty of houses just like it crammed onto the steep hillside on all, uh, all around. How can I spin this mess? Handyman special? Charming old world character? Easy access to the 101? Ah, wait, I've got it. Million dollar views. All right, that's it. Thank you. <laughs>